All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us on today's webinar, Fundraising Events Ideas Your Attendees Will Love. Today, we are sharing some unique and profitable event ideas you can plan this year. So how digital tools create more positive buzz and engagement than traditional methods, including mobile silent auctions. As always, we'll be sending a recording of this webinar and the webinar slides to all registrants via email. And we do want to encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation into the questions box on your control panel. And at the end, we'll have a little bit of live Q&A with our panelists. Speaking of our panelists, let me introduce them. So first off, we'll have Lindsay Hempfill. Uh, she's a customer success manager here at Mobile Cause, and Lindsay advises and guides our customers with fundraising and donor engagement strategies. She's also worked with countless nonprofits on successful campaigns, and will be sharing her breadth of fundraising experience during her presentation. We'll also hear from Jeff Porter. He's the CEO and founder of the mobile auction software Handbid. After noticing a great need for raising funds for worthy causes, he created this company to help nonprofits raise more money at events. He also is no stranger to the nonprofit world. He and his wife formed their own nonprofit. All right, and we put together an information-packed agenda today. Lindsay is going to share three event ideas uh, guaranteed to have your attendees engaged and excited at your event. Jeff will be giving insider tips and uncovering the secrets of silent auctions. And all of this will help your nonprofit plan an amazing and memorable event that will have your attendees falling in love ultimately with your cause. So I'm gonna get started here by actually launching a quick poll. Uh, the question is, what is your biggest worry about planning your next event? So I'm gonna launch this in the polling interface in our software today. And you'll see those poll results or those options coming up uh, on your screen. Go ahead and select your uh, biggest worry and hit submit. And the options there are uncertainty if supporters will be interested in attending, overall participation at the event, meeting the fundraising goal at the event, losing money, and needing support the day of the event. So select, I'm, I'm sure all, all of you are concerned of, over a few of those, but select the one that's the most worrisome for you and go ahead and hit that submit button. We have about two thirds of the audience voting, so I'll leave it open just for a few more moments. Excellent, going once, going twice. All right, cool, let me go ahead and close that poll and check it out, I'll share the results with you. So the good news is that we're gonna be sharing ideas how to make those worrying things a thing of the past. <laughs> and Lindsay, wouldn't you agree? Yes, definitely. So just taking a look at this, a few worries coming up, but um, happy to share some ideas today to address uh, some of these items. Excellent. I'll pass things over to you then. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Alex. And hello, everyone. I'm very excited to have you all with us and really excited to share some fun event ideas to really help boost your nonprofit this coming year. So moving right along. So just a couple things about events. Uh, attendees love events that are memorable, entertaining, inspiring, and energizing. So you really want to look to types of creative events that are fun for your audience. And additionally, as a nonprofit, you love when attendees engage and participate, share on social media, donate, and just can't wait for next year. So Successful events are interactive. You're engaging with your supporters and making them really an integral part of your event. And when events are more interactive, they're more memorable and they make people excited to share with their friends on social and more likely attend uh, to attend again. So I'd love to go through some event ideas today. Starting with our first event. So the first event idea I'd like to share with you was run by an organization, ACE and TJ's Green Kids Carding for Kids. So this organization did a really fun event. It was a go-karting race where teams were able to register to race and the team that ran the most laps would win. So the way that this organization brought in the fundraising element was by incorporating um, and allowing people to buy up or buy down uh, laps. 
And this meant that supporters could buy additional laps for their favorite teams and buy down laps for their competitors for their rival teams. So it brings, it really brings in this friendly level of competition um, and makes it really exciting for the audience and really integrates them as part of the fundraising element. And the way this organization ran it was with a, a keyword element. So they had a keyword for each team, a one buy up keyword and one buy down keyword, where people could text buy up with a number at the end. So for example, team number one, text buy up one to vote for this team to um, buy up laps for them. And they could also have a buy down keyword so you could buy against your rival team um, and take away laps from them. So they brought in the mobile element while also sharing on social media, online ahead of time to really create some buzz around the event and uh, have the individual teams who were actually participating in the race share this out with their own friends and family through the crowdfunding platform to really create um, more interaction, more buzz, and more excitement for the campaign. During the event, um, or prior to the event, they also sold tickets and sponsorships, so they were promoting the event as well through that means. And during the event, they continued to use that keyword. So text buy up one to vote for, or to buy up laps for your favorite um, team. And it really became a fun part of this and everyone was able to participate while ultimately donating to a great cause. So a really fun um, creative event idea there. And, oops, sorry, accidentally went one too far. But did you know um, there are 160, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I went a little bit too far on the slides, so. Looking perfect. So 62% of donors who give to peer to peer campaigns are new donors. So, like I mentioned with the go karting element, um, where they were able to bring these teams in, um, they were able to reach out to a wider audience by sharing this out with their own networks. So, it really helps increase the reach of who you're um, um, reaching out to as far as donor goes donors and hopefully you'll be able to increase with um, crowdfunding as a great tool. Perfect. The next event idea I'd like to share with you was a Dancing with the Stars event. And this was run by Good Neighbor Homeless Shelter. And during this event, local celebrities were paired with experienced dancers to help raise funds for their shelter and homeless education programs. So before the event, the dancing groups were encouraged to fundraise um, for their particular groups, and they did a vote to or donate to vote type scenario. So they would go out and get votes and donations, and they would also promote ticket sales for the live event where there would be a competition between all of the dancing groups. Um, so a really fun element brought into this event. Now, they also brought in a keyword element where each dance team received their own unique keyword. For example, text Shelly to 51555. So they could use that keyword to promote um, to their friends in person, on social media, online, and really get the word out there to have people vote for them. During the event, they used individual thermometers so they each would get their own thermometer based on uh, how much they have raised so far. And like I mentioned, they had a live competition. So um, they would compete, continue to promote their keyword, have everyone text in to donate to vote, and really created um, an exciting environment for the audience to participate. And with the individual thermometers, people were able to see the live progress of how much they've raised up towards the goal and see who was in the lead so that they can continue um, to get those donations in and win the competition. 
So a really fun event idea. Similar ideas also include a bartender challenge. So instead of dancing teams, perhaps a bartender challenge um, if you have bartenders in the local area. Another one would be table captains. So really just an ambassador who is really to come, uh, willing to come on board and help promote this out with um, their own um, networks to continue to raise awareness and excitement around your event. So another fun fact on the next slide, if we can go to the next slide, Hey, Lindsay, this is Alex. So I do have that next slide up. It's the did you know with the $167 amount. Is that coming up on your side? It isn't, but for um, the um, slide there, $167 is the average donation when using text to donate. So really hoping um, to kind of use that as a, a an advice point for increasing your average donation at an event. And if we can go to the next slide, I can talk about the event idea number three. So for the third event idea, um, we have the live thermometer to display at an event. So the thermometer can be used in a live appeal to show donors progress towards a goal. So a really fun visual display to have up on a screen or a projector or a TV and show the goal and exactly what progress is being um, donated towards within that live event. So some of the best practices behind a live thermometer include um, really developing a set goal. So what is the collective goal that you hope to raise for the night? And sharing with your audience, what is the impact of that goal? So by reaching the goal together, what direct tangible item does that tie to as part of a mission to your organization? So the more we're able to elaborate on that, the closer people will feel towards that goal and be more motivated to give. And that can be a monetary goal or even a participation goal. So whether it's a set amount you're hoping to fundraise towards or even just getting 100% of the people involved to participate with a donation, um, we can have different goals to really drive um, a level of inter interactiveness within the event. So the thermometer does become effective because it is a fun interactive element. The engaging display that you can put up on the screen and encourage people to text in and they see their names appear in live time. So um, really interactive and immediate so people can see the immediacy of their actions taking place on the thermometer um, and encourages other people in the room to participate as well. So if you see half of the people at your table texting in and their names scrolling up on the screen, you want a part of that, and uh, it really brings in this group element to get everyone participating uh, within this focal point of a fundraising event. So um, ideally, people are giving through multiple avenues, whether that be text to donate or donations or check, um, just really to encourage donations um, from encourage donations through that event. So the Duke Ellington Fund is another organization who uses the thermometer quite a bit, and they have different programs that they run for their school, and they'll have the thermometer at a live event where they'll be able to display this and encourage donations um, to help raise funds for the different um, art programs at their schools. So a lot of creative ways that you can use this at an event and really one of my favorite tools. Um, I, there's always a lot of fun surrounding the thermometer and it's really well received by an audience. So if we can go to the next slide, um, there's usually, we, it has been seen that there is a 35% increase in event donations when adding a live thermometer. So statistically, this is just helping us see 
how a live interactive element at your event focused on fundraising can really increase the amount of donations that you're seeing at an event. Perfect. And for the next slide, 80% of people believe it's important to come together in person to support a cause. So during a live event, you're bringing a group of people together to share a common goal. So the impact of that goal is really strengthened more and more with supporters when they're able to see the importance of coming together as, an, as a group and um, the impact that that has. So hopefully the examples I share today um, give you some ideas for events that you may be able to apply this coming year and also how they just can continue to inspire your supporters in lots of different ways. So I'm gonna pass things back over to our moderator, Alex, uh, for the rest of the presentation. Awesome, thank you so much, Lindsay. Thanks for sharing those excellent event ideas. Uh, and next up, we're, we're gonna be hearing from Jeff. So Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Alex. I, uh, I agree that those were great ideas from Lindsay. I uh, actually run a derby fundraiser every year and my brain's now spinning with some great ideas that we can do for our next Derby event based on the presentation she just gave. Um, I'm also honored to be here today, speak with everyone. Um, before we get started, I wanted to give you a brief overview of Handbid. Um, so we'd like to describe ourselves as a mobile bidding and special events platform. So we manage event ticketing, registration, guest list, check-in, auctions with mobile bidding, uh, donations, sales, and then ultimately checkout and payment at the end. So how did we get started? Well, we were running our own charity fundraiser for years using paper tickets, paper bid sheets, and we were managing the manual checkout process. And we encountered all the same problems that most people have when they do it that way. We had long lines, we had data entry errors, we had frustrated guests, and we had flat revenue. Okay, so we built Handbid, we ran our first auction in May of 2011. And with Handbid, we doubled our auction revenue over the year before, so we were pretty excited about it. So from there, we've expanded, we've helped, uh, we've run thousands of events, we've helped charities raise over $150 million over the process through their own auction events, and we've evolved the platform ever since, okay? And through this, we've identified also a number of best practices, being the fact that we attend a ton of auction events. So we've observed best practices, we've dispelled a ton of myths, we've identified some really unique ways to raise more money at events. And so what I wanna do today, is I want to address some common beliefs that a lot of folks have who run auctions. And um, these are beliefs that we actually want you to reconsider. Um, then I'm gonna give you six things that we've learned about silent auctions and fundraising. And then I wanna wrap it up by sharing a few other innovative ways that you can raise additional funds at your next event. So let's get started on the next, on the next slide. Okay, so to start off, I wanna talk about the various elements that make up event revenue. And you guys probably recognize almost all of these, okay? So while there may be others that are unique to your event, these here on this slide are the most common methods that we see. And one thing I wanna stress and that we always stress to our clients is that these methods are not mutually exclusive. In fact, we encourage you to have a collection of all of these or at least, a, I'd say at least two or three of these at your event. Okay, and the main reason is that each guest who comes in there may only want to participate using one or two or three of these elements. For instance, the live auction may only appeal to a few select donors who have the financial ability and, and probably also the ego to pay for some of the items that you're going to have in your live auction. And your donations may only appeal to those people who feel connected to your cause and are willing to support it at that time financially. Um, whereas your silent auction or maybe a drawing or a raffle may attract other guests at the event, they're not necessarily ready to donate yet, but they are willing to spend some money if you can give them something in exchange for it. All right, so I'm gonna skip ahead here to the next slide. All right, so before we get into the tips, I want you to reconsider some of the following things that we run into, okay? We often hear, we're just gonna do a paddle raise this year. We've done an auction, auctions are a lot of work, we're just gonna kind of pair it back and we're just gonna do a paddle raise. But our recommendation is that you have a broader collection like we talked about on the last slide, right? You need to maximize participation, okay? The other two ones on here really deal with how long you keep your auction open and kind of the order of, of flow of your, of your event in terms of the components that are in it, okay? So looking at the first one, 
So we need to close our silent auction before our live auction. We hear a lot of benefit auctioneers tell folks this. And you know, I think back in the traditional sense when you had paper bid sheets, this might have made sense because if I'm bidding on paper, I have to get up from my seat, I have to go out to the auction area, I have to look, you know, for my bids and I have to, you know, possibly up them, I have to come back in. So you're going to get a lot of distractions going on because people are going to be up out of their seats and moving around. Well, with technology these days and the fact that a lot of you are already doing mobile bidding or considering it, your guests actually can stay put in their seats, quickly check what's going on in the silent auction, but not distract others who are in the room who want to participate in the live auction. Okay. We auctioneers may also tell your guests that they will want to know how much money they spend in the how much money they will have spent in the silent before the live starts. But we found that live auction bidders and silent auction bidders are typically different people with different motivations. So live auction bidders prefer to be seen. They're often the type that are driven by ego and recognition, so they're willing to spend a lot of money. Where silent auction bidders often don't want to be seen. They're bargain hunters. They're shoppers. They're looking for a deal. So while we do see some overlap, I don't want to say that that doesn't happen. Right. What we have seen is that a lot of the folks participating in your live auction are going to participate in your live auction, whether they've got open silent auction bids or not. OK, what we do know, though, and we've seen this for sure, is that a lot of folks who close their silent auction before they're live actually create a distraction they didn't intend to create. And that is because people will get up and want to check out early and you want them to remain in their seats. Right. So we see this also the same unfortunate impact when people close their auction before their program. So we want people to pay attention. There's no doubt, right? We've got a lot of things to share. We're trying to get people connected to our organization. However, right, um, you close your silent auction, you're going to distract some people who feel like they want to jump, you know, ahead or skip the line or, you know, maybe quickly go check out, maybe even leave. Okay. So we want to avoid that. So those are the things that I want you guys to reconsider. Meanwhile, let's jump into some tips here. All right, secret number one. Okay, so silent auctions allow you to tap into a greater share of a guest's wallet. So what do we mean by that? Well, many of us have heard about this 2% rule, okay? What that is is most American households spend about 2% of their annual household income on charitable giving, okay? So while that amount has changed over the years, the relative percentage hasn't, okay? It's stayed at about 2%. So for your live appeal, your paddle raise, um, you'll be asking a guest to give to your organization some portion of that 2%, okay? But that's not the case with silent auctions, live auctions, or even in some cases, raffles and drawings, right? Because auction participants are shoppers. They're looking and, and willing to buy products and services in exchange for their money, okay? So your auction, they're, they're buying wine, they're buying food, they're buying entertainment, vacations, you name it. And when they're doing that, they're tapping into what we call their discretionary budget. Okay, So a household's discretionary budget is what they're willing to spend above and beyond their essentials. Okay, And it tends to be about 14% of household income. So for a household that's making, say, for example, $100,000 a year, this would be $14,000 versus that 2,000, remember the 2%, that 2,000 of their charity budget. So when customers tell us they just want to do a paddle raise, for example, we talked about in the previous slide, we remind them of this, okay? So let's move on to the next slide here. All right, secret number two. Okay, so let's talk about attention span, right? I talk about this with my kids all the time, right? So we had just addressed two slides earlier when we mentioned that it's not always the best idea to close your silent auction before your program. Well, this is because your guests need and will appreciate you giving them something to do at the event. We'll talk about why here, right? Events last several hours typically. Your guests arrive, perhaps, you know, depending on how your event flows. They come in, they register, they visit the bar for a drink, they mingle with their friends, they may want to shop your auction area after all of that is done, if it exists, okay? But if it's not there and it's not yet time to eat, so what are they gonna do, right? So consider also that if you do have people sitting down for dinner, okay, that they may be sitting at, a, your guests may be sitting at a table with someone they don't know, so they're not gonna be able to strike up a conversation easily. Um, some guests eat faster than others, so they finish early and they're sitting there doing nothing, right? Uh, one thing I can tell you, all of your guests cannot pay attention longer than eight seconds. Okay, yes, research has shown 
that the average human being today, an average adult American has an attention span of eight seconds. And if that startles you, you should also know that the average goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds, okay? So your guests are going to be distracted or they're gonna distract themselves. They're gonna pull out their cell phones. They're gonna text their friends. They're gonna check on their kids. They're gonna post on Facebook. You might as well give them something else to do on their phone at the same time. That's gonna help your auction revenue. So we say you might as well let them bid. All right, moving on. Secret number three. Oh, we went too far. Secret three, okay. So another benefit to silent auctions is the ability to connect with what we call newcomers, okay? So we love to believe that everyone coming to the event is gonna walk in the door and they're gonna donate to our cause. And hopefully that's the case, but we know it's probably not always the case. So having an auction allows people to get something in exchange for their money, and it allows you to get their information. You get their name, their email, their phone number. If you're using mobile bidding tools, it'll certainly collect that for you. Okay, so for example, just last Saturday, right? Here in Denver, I attended a hand bid event. This gentleman came up at the end of the night, he paid his $300 invoice, and he said to me, yeah, you know, a friend brought me. I wasn't planning on spending any money tonight, but then I saw this item and I figured I'd bid on it. Well, now we have his email, his cell phone, the charity can now send him a receipt and a thank you note. And so now they can connect with him. And so hopefully he comes back and hopefully at some point he starts to, to donate to their cause. Okay, so, all right, so what does that have to do with a baseball player on the slide here? Well, we like to use this analogy a lot with our clients. Um, and here's how it goes. So in baseball, hitters are taught that at every at bat, you probably are only gonna get one good pitch to hit. So they say, you know, coaches tell their players all the time, when that pitch comes, don't miss it, okay? We say the same thing to our customers for events. When a new guest comes in that door, you may only have one opportunity to connect with that guest and get them ultimately to participate with you. Having a silent auction or a drawing may prompt them to participate, and it allows you to get their information. Then you can invite them back. So you have that one opportunity, don't miss it. Make sure that you have something that's gonna connect with them. All right, moving on. Next slide here for. All right, we talk about this a lot as well, which is you really need to think about your event as a business, okay? Your charity's business, right? Your organization's a business. Well, your event kind of is as well. So all businesses have revenue that offsets costs for doing business. They make investments in order to increase their revenue, and your event is no different from that. So if you add up all the various costs that go into your event, whether it's the venue, the catering, the bar, the entertainment, the technology, the staff, you need to sit down and ask yourself, which of these is most likely to increase revenue at our event, okay? So I once heard a charity tell me that they were gonna wait a year on mobile bidding because they had upgraded the band. And I had to ask them how they felt the band was gonna impact revenue. Um, so I urge you to really think about and adopt the same mindset as a business. It does take money to make money. You just need to allocate those dollars wisely. All right, moving on to slide number five. All right, secret five. So this again addresses this topic we discussed earlier. When should you close your auction, okay? There's no doubt that it takes a bit of time for your guests to get warmed up for your event. And, and this is probably one area where I would think mobile bidding companies and your traditional benefit auctioneers completely agree, right? Your benefit auctioneers, if they're good, they warm up the crowd because the crowd needs a little bit of that warming up, right? So in a traditional event, here's what we see, right? People come in the door, they register, they head straight to the bar, they mingle with their friends, and then and only then do they start looking at your auction area, okay? And so depending on the lines at the bar, kind of how crowded the event is, this could take anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, all right? And I've seen plenty of events where they say, we're doing registration at six, we're opening the doors for dinner at seven, the program starts at eight and everybody's out by nine, and we're closing the silent auction at seven. Well, I mean, we all come from different parts of the country or the world. In Denver here, right, where I probably attend most of my events, um, people, when registration starts at six, people do not arrive at six. Uh, they probably arrive somewhere between six and seven. And I've been to events where people are literally walking in the door, going to the bar and finding out the silent auction was closing. So we tell you, you need to give people more time to bid. Okay, so when we do walkthroughs with our clients, we sometimes get stuck into, um, the timeline of their events, and we have to encourage those, especially those new to mobile bidding, to keep their auction open longer, okay? So one, you can open your auction in advance with mobile bidding. That allows your guests time at home to get set up. 
Um, they can kind of get used to the system. Uh, they can browse your items. You also don't have to close your auction early that night, right? You used to have to do that. You know, if you had a lot of items and you had a lot of bid sheets that you had to tabulate, you know, you had to sit down and you had to give yourself time, right? Well, what you what used to take you minutes now takes a mobile bidding application seconds to do. So you don't need all that time anymore. You need though get people some time to get warmed up, get into the event and get bidding. So we say you need to give people a minimum of two to three hours to bid. Okay. All right. Secret number six. All right. You're probably not surprised that I put this slide in here, right? That you should be adding technology um, to your event, right? We urge you to consider it, right? Um, you can connect your ticket sales directly to registration. Your sponsors can buy tables. Your guests can buy tickets. All of them can register a card in advance, right? Um, your sponsors can manage their own guest list, right? Your guests can bid from anywhere on their phone or computer, including from home. That's all that's going to do is keep people connected to your auction and your event. When I can allow people to bid from anywhere, that means that they're not going to get easily disconnected, right? You get real-time statistics on auction revenue. You know what items are getting bids, which ones aren't. You know how you need to make adjustments. You can do it on the fly. You can communicate with your guests centrally through broadcast messages. And then your guests can view their invoice at the end of the auction and pay from their phones. And that's gonna eliminate a long checkout line. It's gonna make everybody much happier. Okay, so a couple more things on this. So one, depending on where you live, this may vary, but only slightly. What we see across the country, where well, we, we do auctions in seven countries, but at least across the US, what we see is nearly 100% of the people attending a fundraising event today own a smartphone, okay? Um, and just for your information, uh, Google and Apple are roughly 98% of the smartphone market. And then I'm gonna throw a kind of an interesting stat out to you. Um, while Google and Android have a much higher share of the market in general and cross, you know, just kind of across the general smartphone market, not true um, for fundraising events. Most fundraising events, especially activity and registered bidders and bids is dominated by iPhones, okay? Um, and so just, just just keep that in mind. But uh, the last thing I wanna say, right, it might be going through your head right now, and the answer is very simple, no, your guests are not too old to use technology, okay? So you might need some staff or volunteers to help some of them, um, but we see tremendously positive reception from everybody because you're giving them a more convenient way to participate in your event, okay? And they appreciate that. All right, so we're gonna wrap up with some revenue tips here. I'm gonna skip ahead to that. So expanding revenue beyond auctions. We talk about auctions all the time, but our clients have come up with some really innovative ways to use our software and technology to raise money. Um, and one of these actually ties in, you know, to the uh, carding for kids example uh, that Lindsay gave earlier. And it's this concept called donate to vote. Um, we, at our Kentucky Derby event, we tried this as well. We did a ladies hat contest. And so when people came in the door, we snapped their photo, we entered them as an item into our system on the fly and it was a $5 vote. And so um, that $5 vote also was a donation to the organization. So, you know, it raised another $1,500 or so. Um, and then the person who raised the most money was the winner of the hat contest. So you voted for the winner through your donations. We have a big fashion show we do for a client, uh, over a thousand people at it in Tulsa, Oklahoma every year. They do what they call a fan favorite. That fan favorite raised, gosh, I think somewhere on the order of four or five thousand dollars. And so every contestant was entered. They were put into categories, and people went through and they made those donations, um, which represented votes. We've done lip sync contests. Um, all of those things are kind of really fun, unique ways to do, um, you know, kind of raise additional money on top of your auction. Okay. What we also find, especially with a lot of our golf tournaments, is that our clients are selling more stuff, right? Um, they're noticing that at golf tournaments, people are bringing less and less cash to the golf tournament, um, but they still want to sell mulligans and t-shirts and whatnot. They're just using Hambit as kind of a point of sale system to kind of organize and collect all that, um, especially when they're out on the holes. So maybe they're running a particular promotion uh, at a hole. Maybe it's a contest, a putting contest or whatever, and people can pay to get into that. They can just put it on their quote unquote Hambit tab, right? Pay at the end of the night. Okay, so think about those. It also allows you to expand your inventory. Um, so think about, um, we have a lot of schools, that, especially in the Colorado area, for whatever reason, they just didn't build big enough parking lots. So a lot of schools out here sell parking spaces. 
And um, so they auctioned them off and it was usually for a year, but now that you're in a mobile technology, you don't have to have um, just a year, right? Maybe if you're on paper bid sheets, that's all you could fit on the table, but now you can expand that out to maybe per trimester or per month. And so you really are able to expand your inventory out beyond just the thing that you were selling before. And I think you might generate some more revenue from that. And the last one on the slide really talks about ways to take some of those smaller donations that you're getting. Um, you know, maybe you're getting a $10 Subway gift card or a $15 Starbucks gift card, and you're making a valiant effort to bundle them all together and create a great basket of them. But maybe there's just a, some that just don't fit, okay? One thing that you can consider doing is doing a mystery box sale, right? So go out and buy a bunch of generic boxes, you know, and put, you know, on, I'd say on average, maybe a, a 10 or $15 gift card in there. You're going to have to get a couple big ones, right? Because you're going to have to market this and say, you have the opportunity for a $100, you know, gift card at this famous steakhouse or whatever. Uh, but there's only a few of those. Most of them are $10 and you sell them for 20 or 25 or $30. And people just like the chance opportunity. It's very similar to what you're probably already doing with a wine pool. Uh, it's just that it's, this is a new other way that you can kind of grab some of those smaller donations and um, and sell them for a little bit more money. Okay, so that's all I got. If you have any questions or you want to learn more, I urge you to visit a couple places here. So one is our Hambid University page where you can download a number of our eBooks and uh, we'll make sure that the PowerPoint that goes out has those links in it or you can go to our website and up at the top, there's a link to resources and it says Academy and you can download those there. Or uh, we have a knowledge base, it's service.hambit.com. You can go over there. A lot of it is instructional videos on how our software works, but there's some other good uh, resources in there and some best practices. Or reach out to us and schedule a demo. So I'm gonna, and I think Alex, I'm handing it back over to you. Indeed, thank you, Jeff, for letting us yeah. in on all those silent auction secrets. <laughs> uh, and let's take another quick poll here. So now that we've heard about several fundraising event ideas, uh, which one of these are you most interested in trying? So look at your screen here and select the option from the poll. Our options are uh, an event thermometer, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising or crowdfunding, text to keyword, or perhaps silent auction. So go ahead and make your selection there, and I'll leave this open for another 10 or 15 seconds. Give everybody a chance to read through those and choose what they're thinking they might partake in or try. Excellent. We have about 65% of the audience voting. If you, if you haven't submitted yet, go ahead and select your option and hit submit. Going once, going twice. All right, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll here, and I'll just share the results with everybody. So it looks like the winner out here is the event thermometer, followed by silent auction, and then that peer-to-peer -peer fundraising or crowdfunding. Cool. Thanks for all your feedback there. Let's hide those. And at this point, I want to transition gears a little bit, just for a few minutes, to answer any questions that our folks might have. So feel free to submit your questions, if you haven't asked them already, into the chat box the questions box there on your control panel. And uh, I'll go ahead and start with a question for Lindsay. So can you use a thermometer before your event to help increase donations? Thank you. Yeah, great question. And a thermometer can be used prior to an event. Um, there is also the idea of a campaign thermometer, which incorporates the total funds that you raised towards an event. So just beyond um, the live appeal you might do at the event, this could also include ticket sales, sponsorships, raffle tickets, any additional things that you might be selling that really attribute to part of the entire fundraising amount and um, can be put on the thermometer to display the overall goal that you've reached, uh, well, the overall that you have raised towards um, the event in total with all of those items in place and then um, also just opening it up for donations and then using the event to really push a final um, 
push towards the goal to continue to allow people to donate um, additionally or if they perhaps didn't pay for their ticket if they had a table sponsor instead um, for them to participate too so definitely able to incorporate the thermometer pre an event um, with different elements in mind indeed cool thanks so much Lindsay uh, next question here is for Jeff how do you design auctions for events whose attendees may not have deep pockets? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I think that's where you're going to have to lean a little bit more towards the silent auction side um, over the live auction. Because live auction is, again, driven by uh, income and revenue and ego. Your silent auction is going to be driven a little bit more through what I would consider to be a, a bargain hunting mindset. Uh, the other thing to note um, is people will get emotionally kind of connected to winning items in a silent auction, especially if you if you can keep them connected through mobile bidding technology. So while they might not have a deep pocket mindset when they walk in the door, I've had plenty of people tell me at the end of the day, I spent way more money than I wanted to, right? One of them was a good friend of mine and she's she's a benefit auctioneer and she came to our event as a guest and she was kind of hanging out and she said, Oh my God, I just spent $400 in your silent auction. I wasn't planning to spend anything. She goes, but I just couldn't lose. There's just no way I was going to let that happen. I was winning. I was bidding on this thing and I just spent way too much money on this item, but I had a great time doing it. So um, think about, you know, the fact that, you know, people may not be coming in the door necessarily with a deep pocket mindset, um, but you can you can create such a game like experience that I think you you can maximize uh, their opportunity. Excellent, thank you, sir. Uh, all right, we have another question here for Lindsay. Uh, can you tell us more on how to use table captains at events to help drive fundraising? Yeah, great question. So. Table captains can be used to um, basically assign a table captain. They get a certain amount of seats that they're able to um, sell or promote or give away. And um, these table captains would be going out and filling those tables for the nonprofit. So a couple of ways to incorporate it, but crowdfunding is a good one because you're able to equip them with a page that they can create online um, that links to either a ticketing form or a donation form depending on how your event is set up. And they can share that out with their potential um, event attendees and allow them to purchase tickets um, or make a donation to be part of that table. So it's really in empowering them with a tool to go out there, share it, um, bring new people into the event who you may not have necessarily invited um, before, whether you didn't have their contact information. Um, ideally, we're bringing in these new um, people to your organization, building some awareness towards them and um, getting some support from them as well. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, another question here for Jeff. Can you give us an example of a game that might help uh, generate revenue at an event? Sure. Uh, I've seen I've seen mechanical bull riding. Um, I have seen, um, you know, some of your more carnival type games, depending on the theme of your event. I've seen the, you know, the um, football toss and and you know that kind of stuff or knock the bottles over um, i was at an event recently where they had a cornhole tournament um, and they had people buying into that um, we see a lot of casino nights um, so we see people doing um, those types of things and you have to do them with um you know you have to do them with uh, um, fake money in most cases depending on kind of what the gambling laws are um, but uh, you can get really creative um, if you can want to engage, um, you know, and then you have your classics as well. You've got your heads or tails game that most benefit auctioneers will play. That's still super popular um, for a lot of events as well. Excellent. Uh, okay, let's see the question or a question just came in that I think I can handle and it was in regards to the sort of content that we're distributing after the event. So we will be sending you the slides as well as a recording of this webinar so you'll get audio uh, also okay cool so um, I think that concludes our event today uh, I know there's a lot of other questions coming in there's hundreds of attendees but only a few of us so apologies uh, we're certainly saving those questions 
Uh, but at this point, I, I just want to mention, if you're interested in learning more about what you've heard today, you can speak directly with an expert here at Mobile Cause by submitting a survey at the end of our presentation, or you can call us toll-free, 888-661-8804, and you'll see that number is on the slide here that I have up. You can also visit uh, our website. It's go.mobilecause.com and then forward slash request demo. All right, once again, I want to thank both of our presenters uh, for their excellent input and advice today. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and I also want to thank you, our audience, for attending. Uh, all of you are going to receive a webinar recording, as I mentioned, along with the slideshow shortly. And as a Valentine's Day treat, I look forward to the sweetheart deal included in the follow-up email. So keep an eye out for that. Excellent. That being said, happy event planning and have a wonderful Valentine's Day, all. Thanks for joining today. Cheers.